Uh, thanks everyone for coming to today's session. It's uh, Sequencing DNA. With, um, David Eccles, please welcome. DNA. It's in our blood. It's in our food. It's even in our genes. Tēnā koutou i tēnē ata, ko kurahaupo te waka, ko tapuai o uenuku te maunga, ko wairo te awa, ko rangatāne te iwi, ko huataki taku tipuna, ko moa taku whānau, ko rawiri ekaru tōku ingoa. Thank you all for coming to hear me talk about DNA sequencing with Linux cores and nanopores. I'll put my talk transcript into the Zenodo repository. So anyone who missed what I said can go there and look at it afterwards. Also, you can visit that repository either right now to see my backup data or shortly after I've given my talk to see what I've actually produced today, if it works. So, anyway, I call myself a theoretical geneticist. What that practically means is that I spend a lot of time behind computers thinking about DNA, but not much time doing practical experiments. Today, I want to change that. I want to show the Linux, the Linux enthusiasts what DNA looks like in different ways, both as a physical thing and as a constructed string on my laptop here. Hopefully today we'll give you a much better idea of what it looks like, both in real life and in the symbolic life on a computer that we all know and love. Now, for those who haven't read my abstract, what I'm going to do is attempt a full workflow of DNA sequencing, from food to figures. In preparation for this, um, before I started my talk today, I prepared this flow cell that's sitting right here on the DNA sequencer and warmed it up a bit. Okay, here we go. On this slide are my instructions. What I'm going to try to do is extract DNA from a food that I got at a cafe on campus. This was my lunch from yesterday. Right, let's get to it. On this table, I have a mortar and pestle and the chickpea salad. Now, I put the food into the mortar. That's this bowl thing. I want, oh, a few chickpeas. Let's say about, um, what have we got here, six or seven. A um, bit of pumpkin to give it a bit of fiber. Uh, and maybe we'll throw in some of the onion here as well. Okay. Now it's time for me to grind it up. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is make sort of a chickpea soup out of the... Um, out of the uh, chickpea and the pumpkin. So that's, that's what I'm doing here, grinding it up to try and liquefy it a little bit. Now, what I'm doing is sort of trying to squish up the cells and, and force the DNA out of them. I know that most of the cells are quite resilient, but I'm hoping that there's gonna be enough here that uh, I will find useful amounts of DNA in here. 
Um, it's a little bit dry, not very palatable. So oh, I'm going to add a tiny bit of water, mix it up a little bit more. Right, now that looks just like custard. Now also on this table here, I have a cup and I've got a tea strainer. Now when I, when I bought this, the mesh size was a bit too large, um, so I uh, cut up an old sheet and uh, I'm using that as a substitute for a fine mesh. So now the, the DNA will dissolve in the water. So what I want to do is pull the dissolved DNA out and sort of leave all the solid chunky bits behind. Excuse fingers. Okay. Oh, sorry. I forgot to change the next slide. There we go. Um, previously, I attempted this with yogurt, and um, I actually broke the tea strainer, which is, yeah. Okay, so now the next step is to use some methylated spirits. Now DNA, as I said, dissolves in water, um, but you can use uh, high concentration alcohol to sort of scare it out. So this is um, some methylated spirits that I bought at the pharmacy here. I was a bit too scared bringing alcohol along on the plane, so I decided to buy it here in Christchurch. Now, because this involves alcohol, I'm going to get a bit kitted up. So, got here a lab coat. Uh, I've also got some gloves. These were also bought from a pharmacy, just in case anyone wants to buy some of those if they want to do some extraction themselves. And uh, I do have glasses on, but I decided just to be safe, I'd have another pair. Okay, so now the idea is to slide the alcohol over the top. I want to make, oh, I've got very shaky hands. I want, want to make a layer over the top Um, without sort of disturbing the liquid underneath too much. It's usually a good sign if you start seeing bubbles at this stage. I can see a few bubbles. I'm going to um, see if I can maybe mix it up a little bit more. Okay, now if this works, you should start seeing some stringy bits in there. Um, okay, this, this is what's known affectionately in the DNA sequencing uh, world as a DNA jellyfish. So, I'm going to do a bit of fishing. I've got here a toothpick, so I'm going to bend this toothpick into a hook and see if I can catch me a jellyfish. Okay. It's a good sign that I can see stuff because this means that it's probably going to work. 
Okay, so the idea is to try and hook out as much DNA as possible and as little alcohol as possible. Okay, so I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's, there's a little bit on there. Now I'm going to put it in this um, small dish of water that I've prepared. Actually, I'll tip some of that water out. Um, and the DNA will actually dissolve in the water, um, leaving behind sometimes some other particulate matter. Now, I should probably point out that this isn't just DNA. I said before I put some pumpkin in for fiber. Um, Pumpkin, for whatever reason, also seems to have some other proteins which come out as well as the DNA, and it actually makes it easier to do a bit of fishing. So, so there was a functional reason for the pumpkin. Okay. So that's the DNA extraction and concentration done. Now, I'm going to transfer the liquid from there into two small tubes here. Even though it doesn't look like much in biology, or at least sample preparation terms, it's a huge amount there. Okay, now I have these two tubes, I, I better label them, uh, chickpea, maybe one, and uh, chickpea two. I have these two tubes, but you know, maybe there's still a bit of solid matter here. So, um, a week or so ago, I printed my own centrifuge. So, <laughs> it was designed in OpenSCAD, just in case you're interested. Um, and there will be a, a link to the Thingiverse model for it on the Zenodo page. I'm going to spin it up a bit. <laughs> Now this, when I tried to do this a, a couple of days ago, I saw that it, it didn't actually do all that much, but it gives me a chance to show off my 3D printing. <laughs> so, there we have it. Some sort of whitish liquid, hopefully containing slightly purified DNA. Okay, now it's time to start using some commercially produced sequencing kits. This one here is one from a company called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. They happen to be the same company that creates, makes, produces this DNA sequencer here. Uh, this kit in particular is called a rapid barcoding kit. That allows me to attach a DNA barcode to a sample so that I can run two samples at the same time and tell them apart on the computer side of things. In this case, I uh, actually prepared some DNA in a lab in advance uh, last week, uh, just, just in case the extraction didn't work today. So, our sample today 
our sample today will get barcode number one, and the mishmash from a week ago will get barcode number two. What I'm, what I'm showing you here is the entire sample preparation process of this uh, sequencing kit. The first step is to break up the DNA and add the barcodes. I need seven and a half microliters of my sample. Now, for those who need a bit of an idea of how much that is, uh, one drop of water dripping from a tap is about 50 microliters, give or take 20 or so. So this is about a seventh of that amount. Well, there's something in that tip. Now, I don't want to contaminate these, so that tip's going to go. Oh, I've forgotten which tube I used. Oh no, there it is. I better label this. Okay, and the next one is the sample from last week. Um, this sample is a bit brown, uh, that's, that's not the sample's fault. I actually put some magnetic beads in there, uh, and I wasn't able to pull them all out. Uh, but magnetic beads shouldn't be a problem for the sequencing. Right, next thing is a fragmentation mix, which is um, happily provided by the sequencing kit. Now from this, this has RB01 on it. Uh, maybe I shouldn't care so much about focus. And I need um, two and a half microliters of this. I'm not going to do the maths on that. Okay, there's something in there. Now that goes into my one tube, which I have labeled. I think I'm just gonna leave that open. And I'm gonna label this two tube now. Okay, so then we have the the second barcoding mix. Oh. Okay, I managed to pick up something. And that's going to go in the two tube. Now, um, I actually do need to spin these down, so I'll get out my centrifuge again. Okay. So now I have two, yeah, two tubes with liquid. Now these are meant to be heated for a minute at 30 degrees Celsius. Luckily, I have hands, and hands are an excellent source of 30 degrees Celsius heat. <laughs> um, I meant to wait for about a minute for this, uh, so what can I talk about? Uh, these, yeah, these samples are left for about a minute to sit and stew and think about their life. A barcode is a thing that is inserted into the DNA to attach onto the DNA so that 
when I do the sequencing and read the DNA, it will also read the barcode at the same time. So the, the barcode is um, a piece of DNA that uniquely identifies a sample. Now, next, I need a source of 80 degrees Celsius heat. So, it just so happens that uh, someone provided me with such a source. So I'm hoping that this is about 80 degrees. Uh, the, the purpose of this is to kill the, the uh, munchy things that I added in a few minutes ago. Now, they need to sit there for another minute. Um, so, so this is to make sure that the fragmentation enzymes are suitably dead and won't give me any funny business later on. Um, this, once, once these are inactivated, I'm able to pull these uh, two samples together. Um, now that the samples are barcoded, uh, they, they can be combined and then I should be able to separate them later. Okay. I'll take uh, five microliters of each and put them in a new tube. Okay, now that the fragmentation mix is uh, inactivated, I can add my rapid adapter primer, which is in here. And for this, I need one microliter. That's a very tiny amount. I'm not actually sure if I'm going to be able to get one microliter, so I'll probably try and get a little bit more than one. This needs to rest for about five minutes. Um, I will spin it down again. Now, um, to this sample, I need to add a little bit of water. And then I need to add some uh, fuel mix, which gives the sequencing reaction energy, 34 microliters. And then to that, I need to add in some loading beads. The purpose of these uh, loading beads is to allow the DNA to sink down and hit the nanopores. Okay, so these get added in. Okay, so we have our sample there. Again, it's whitish liquid, that's the loading beads. And now um, I need to create some capillary action to allow my sample to be uh, sucked down onto the flow cell matrix. Okay. And now, I can drop my sample onto the sequencer.
Okay, and that's the end of all the practical stuff of what I'll be doing today. The rest of it is all done on computer. Okay, this is the Linux user interface of the sequencing software. I'm going to create a sequencing run, call it um, LCA 2019. Um, we have a rapid barcoding kit. I want to do base calling I only want to run it for point, well, I want to run it for about six minutes. Um, and I'm going to put it in the directory that I've specifically created for this. And now I try starting it. Now, if this has all worked, and I'm not suggesting that it, okay. So, so the flow cell currently is running at um, 26 degrees. Uh, it needs to get to temperature. It needs to get to about 34 degrees. Um, while uh, that's getting to temperature, I'm going to show you a video. This is um, the longest DNA sequence that's ever been sequenced on one of these Minion devices. Uh, this is a DNA sequence that is 2.3 million bases long, and you're seeing a run through the entire sequence. Um, we're probably not going to get to the end before the flow cell has uh, finished doing its thing. Um, but the point is, there's lots of DNA there, um, and it takes a long time to get through. But one of the other things that I want to um, to show you is what DNA sounds like when it's moving through one of these nanopores. Um, this DNA sequencer uh, sequences DNA via electrical signals. As DNA goes through a pore, it alters an electrical signal, and you can express that as sound. So, so that's the sound of DNA going through a nanopore which has been uh, frequency modulated. Hiya. Hello. Is this on? <laughs> um, what are the error rates like? Okay, the, the error rates, um, the DNA sequencer produces about 5 to 10% error. Um, so that's, that's not particularly good, but um, this particular sequencer has really, really long sequences, and the error rates are effectively random, and so you can, you can sort of work around the error, ev even though it is quite high. Hi, I just wondered how you clean the sequencer to get rid of all the DNA out of it. Uh, once, once it's done a sequencing run. Um, we, we have these uh, sequencing flush kits. Uh, it's a two-step process. One is to, um, I think, un, unhook the DNA from the pores, and the other is to flush it out. But also, um, the flow cells that go into the sequencer are, well, they're, they're recyclable devices. So, so the sequencer itself, um, 
we have these. Got another one here. Uh, we have these. Um, this is this is. Oh. Sorry, I've I've killed my webcam software. Um, this is the tiny thing that does the business of the sequencing. So that that goes into the sequencing device. Okay. Um, now the sequencer has reached temperature. And um, it is actually sequencing stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it's working. Um, so we have sequences which are here. Um, I'm going to bring this window over here. So these are the sequences that were produced just now. Um, Now, because I don't really want to leave empty-handed, uh, I'm going to run, there's a program, a web program called Blast, which allows me to look up a sequence in a public database and find out where it came from. And once I do that, I'm gonna call this finished. Okay, so we have a sequence. It's from tomato. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> I think that needs another round of applause, eh?